So I am absolutely thrilled to be joined today by Lara Bryden, who is a naturopathic doctor. She's also best-selling author of the Hormone Repair Manual and the Period Repair Manual, both of which are absolutely amazing books. If you haven't, I rarely say this, but if you haven't got these books and you're a woman that is struggling in any way with your periods at all or that transition through perimenopause and menopause, and you absolutely should check these books out. They just are such an incredible guide. It's amazing to have you here, Lara. I'm so excited to have you join the show. Thanks for having me, Angela. And we had to, because we're on opposite sides of the planet, we had to get our time zones aligned, didn't we? We did. Yeah. We did. So <laughs> I'm in, New, kind of I'm in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very early for you. It's, it's evening for me, and I almost never do interviews in the evening. So this is a special occasion. <laughs> Ah, so I'm very grateful. And like yeah. I'm going often interview at 6.30 in the morning, so I'm excited to have you here. Um, so let's start off. Do you know, I think the best place to start is so many women don't really, we're not even taught it properly in school, I don't believe. Um, so many women don't really understand why our periods are so important and even why in those years when you are cycling, just why ovulation itself is so important and health protective. So I think that might be a good place to start if you can summarize for people. Yeah. Yeah. It's because ovulation is how women make hormones. So men make their hormones, make their testosterone every day. That's a normal thing for them. But as women, it's very different. We make our hormones in a monthly pattern. We make uh, estrogen leading up to ovulation, and then we make estrogen and progesterone after ovulation. And both of those hormones are very important for general health, not just for making a baby. And progesterone itself only happens if we ovulate, doesn't it? And it's really important for actually kind of feeling calm and relaxed. I think people underestimate that because you make the point in both the books that actually many doctors, for example, will just associate like traditional conventional medical doctors will associate progesterone with um, thinning of the uterine lining, but actually it has many more benefits for women in terms of it being very calming. Um, can you explain yeah. a little bit more? Cause I think it's really important that people understand why it's so important to have progesterone production while we still can. Absolutely. It is our calming hormone. It interacts in the brain with what's called the GABA receptor, which is also where Valium interacts and alcohol interacts. Of course, progesterone is better than either of those substances. It's our own natural Valium every month. And it, it's really important to also clarify that there's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control, even though they call it that sometimes or all the time, really, but those, all those drugs are progestins. So in terms of the brain, especially there's a big difference between real progesterone that you can make or take as the brand Eutrogestin or the brand Prometrium and versus progestins, which are very different. One of the other things that progesterone does for the brain, so it works, interacts with the GABA receptors, it calms the brain. It also helps to stabilize the HPA axis, which is our adrenal axis that regulates our stress response system. So as we, if, if we're in a state of lower progesterone, we're less able to cope with stress. That's what happens in our forties. And conversely, if we're stressed, it's harder to ovulate and make progesterone. So it really does, it can become a vicious cycle under stress. Mm. And I think this is what's really hard, isn't it? For women is the forties is actually a really stressful time. Like I know, you know, I'm yeah. 45 now and I look at my life, obviously my parents are aging. So that brings its own set of challenges. They have health problems. My two of my boys now are turning teenagers. So they have yeah. their own kind of life and life problems that they're bringing. Um, they, I guess it's like a super busy time in a woman's life. And what she really needs to do is dial things back. But there's this friction, isn't there? Because so much, particularly if she has a successful career or business, there's so much that's being demanded of her at that time. It's, you've, you've stated it very well. It, it's physiologically because we're going through second puberty and we're losing progesterone and our stress response system is destabilizing and our, our brain is recalibrating, as I explain in the book. Mm. Ideally, it should be a time of rest to get through the seven or so years that it takes to do that. Unfortunately, for all the reasons you've just listed, it's a time of being for some women, busier than ever before. And that is sometimes a, a recipe for disaster, actually. If you're trying to do more than ever before, but your brain is finding it harder to challenge with, you know, harder to deal with stress than ever before, that can lead to burnout and insomnia and, you know, 
potentially depression and anxiety. So these are all things that I address in the book. And it's difficult because what I see so many with so many of my clients and the women that come to see me is on top of that, they're now feeling like they're getting sort of um, aesthetic symptoms, right, that they didn't have before. And they know that they're related to health, potential health issues as well. So obviously they feel like their skin is aging more quickly. So, and that can happen on it with a drop off in collagen, but then also they're starting to get this abdominal weight gain that they never had before. And many women yeah. are aware now that that is linked to potentially metabolic diseases as well. So commonly what I'll see is people come to me and they'll say, I just can't understand it. I'm now fasting for at least 16 hours a day. I'm doing two <laughs> classes in the gym or two online yeah. classes. I go running every day. And actually it sounds so counterintuitive, but I find myself having to say, we just need to take stuff away, not add it in. And then your body will release a lot of that weight. But if you keep piling on the pressure, it almost compounds this issue, doesn't it? Yeah. So we, all of us experience a shift to insulin resistance with especially in the later phases of perimenopause i talk about the four phases of perimenopause in my book usually starting in your early 40s into your mid 40s by your late 40s you're in this later stage of perimenopause with much lower levels of progesterone which is not good for weight because progesterone is normally a metabolic stimulant we're having phases of lower estrogen by that point which reduces sensitivity to insulin so we all and, and plus we have a what i describe in the book as a relative androgen excess or sort of a relative testosterone dominance that starts to shine through, especially for any women with a history of PCOS that can come through more so at this time. And that all contributes to insulin resistance. Now, not everyone is going to develop full-blown insulin resistance, but I think we all start to tend in that direction. So that's why, I mean, just, I guess stated very simply, by this point, late 40s into our 50s, I do think we need to be lower carb than we were in our 20s and 30s, for example. That might be one, one of several ways to mitigate that, that change in metabolic rate. And the other thing that's happening is stress hormones, cortisol being higher because of, partly because we just talked about with the loss of progesterone, also just the stress, like being busy, high cortisol contributes to insulin resistance. And the other thing that contributes to weight gain in perimenopause is lack of sleep. I just saw a very interesting study, like just a brand new study about that, actually identifying that perhaps is one of the key mechanisms. I can share that with you. We can put that in the show notes if you want. Yeah, that would be great. So that, that makes sense to me. So it then becomes, okay, the, the priority has to be sleep, which I know is sometimes easier said than done when you're in your mid to late forties, sleep can become elusive. But as I say to my own patients, don't choose exercise over sleep. Like if you haven't had enough sleep, there's no point in setting your alarm to go to the gym because that is just spinning your wheels at that point. Your metabolism is not functioning if you haven't had at least somewhat close to what you used to be getting. And just to, I mean, for any of the listeners, I don't know what your experience, Angela, has been, but like some of my perimenopausal patients, they might get like sometimes four hours a night. Or, you know, their, their sleep is very, Definitely. Yeah, really, very really in trouble. It really yeah, is. Because and of, as you're saying, they're often setting the alarm to go and work out early when yeah. in actual fact, sleep itself, I always say to clients, sleep you can sleep yourself thin like it is so important yeah. and we don't there's a myth I think there was a study I saw that that yeah. basically kept people awake for 24 hours and they burnt 147 extra calories that was it because sleep itself right. is actually really metabolically demanding isn't it well that, that's true I mean I guess it's what happens but not just the calories we burn during sleep the way sleep improves our physiology and our insulin sensitivity and sets us up therefore during the day to have a more functioning body metabolism. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. It's important. It's, as you say, on um, both fronts, but I think women do then struggle with sleep. And again, that's, you talk about this in the book because yeah. how you um, behave in those perimenopausal years is so important, isn't it? In terms of whether you're setting yourself up for things later, like dementia, heart disease, osteoporosis, like it's actually, there's never almost never been a more important time to really focus on your health. And that's something I look a lot at kind of nutrigenomics. And it's something I noticed with my DNA when I looked at it is I do carry a copy of APOE4. So I know that I'm more vulnerable to Alzheimer's. So for me, it's, I find it empowering. I think the more information and, yeah. and part of the reason that I love sharing 
your content and other experts' content mm -hmm. on the podcast is really to make women aware because the more information we have, the more we can protect our health. Because actually, and I think you say this in the, in the hormone repair manual, um, once you transition through menopause, actually, you're the other side of it. That 12 months yes. after your period, life is better. It's not people yeah. almost don't want it to happen, do they? But it's it's better. Can you explain well, a bit about that? Yeah, so there's, so there's so many things I want to respond to there. That was all really good. So, yeah, what what is not explained to us, I think, very well is that the, the worst of it is the the preamble to the final period, like the worst for in terms of symptoms, if they're going to be symptoms and not everyone has symptoms so that we have to acknowledge that as well. But if women are going to experience symptoms, it's almost always in that anywhere between two, usually more like seven or eight up to 10 years before the final period and the one year after the final period, that's sort of the worst time. And then after that, you, what I call in the book, you achieve menopause or you graduate to menopause, which is a kinder and calmer place to be and everything stabilizes and the brain is through its recalibration process that I describe in the book. Perimenopause is very much second puberty. And we know like when we see kids in puberty, they're acting a bit crazy, potentially like they're having, you know, their brains are changing, but we don't think, oh, that's how they're always going to be now, right? Like we know that's, temporary and it's the same in our 40s and so I, I give a couple examples about that and just reassurance that this is not how you're always going to be especially if you've with the insomnia or the mood or another good example is um, potentially fibromyalgia or you know any symptoms that can flare up during our 40s that's a temporary inflammatory state that should settle down should improve as a, a lot of um immune calibration going on as well. So the other thing I want to respond to from what you said, along the line of the brain system re or the brain re rewiring, recalibrating, the immune system recalibrating, it's a critical window for health. This is what you were saying a few minutes ago about how it's a very important time. Because it's a time of such change, if something goes off goes amiss during these years you know if, if we do develop um you know more if, for example insulin resistance or we do you know if our disease a disease state begins during that time it's more likely to continue than if it happened at another time because we're in this time of change so it's a it's a critical window it's kind of a if you will kind of a sensitive time also a window of opportunity because if we can look after our health during this time then we can come up the other side still healthy and much more robust in our health less vulnerable to stress potentially or other insults the the dementia example is quite a good one actually because there's quite a, bit, a lot of research about that i quote a researcher named well, a couple of them in the book lisa Moscone. she has a book as well about um the, the brain and the effect of menopause on the brain and another researcher um, Roberta Brinton they're both neuroscientists and they've come to the conclusion that menopause the risk for menopause or sorry the risk for dementia begins in menopause so it's not that menopause causes dementia it's that if you have other risk factors and are vulnerable to dementia, then menopause is the turning point for that. And then it manifests, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years later, but it starts in menopause. So from that angle, again, it's a window of opportunity. It's not about scaring people. It's just about, like I say, if there was ever time to try to get enough sleep, to try to move the body, at least to some degree, you know, get some exercise to, I talk about avoiding alcohol to, not have too much sugar, all of those basic things to not smoke would be another one, like a really basic thing. If there was ever a time to do all those things, perimenopause is the time to do it, you know, to really take those very simple boxes for health and brain health in particular. And this is, so perimenopause is anywhere between two and 10 years before we hit menopause, just so people really understand. And menopause yeah. marks 12 months from your last period, doesn't it? Yeah, the definition I use is the one by my colleague, Professor Geraldyn Pryor, who helped me with this book quite a lot. She's a Canadian endocrinology professor. She calls menopause, I love it, 
uh, the life phase that begins 12 months after our last period. So menopause is the rest of our life. It's potentially the next three or four decades. And mostly in menopause, we should be okay. I mean, there's a few symptoms, obviously. I talk about vaginal dryness and bladder issues and some risk to bone health. Some of those things appear in my book in the chapter, What Comes After? But mostly what we're talking about today is those, the turbulent years of leading up to the final period and just after the final period. Mm. Yeah. And one of the things that I see as well is doctors are still too ready, as they were with me when I was diagnosed with PCOS in my 20s, to, in fact, I was prescribed this from the age of about 50, is just to prescribe the contraceptive pill. Nothing to do with contraception. Yeah. It's like, here we go, here's a band aid, too. And it's really interesting when I've looked back on this because I suffer terribly, listeners of the podcast will know, with postnatal depression and the links between the use of the pill and depression yeah. um, but it's so readily prescribed isn't it and I think you talk in the book about why the contraceptive pill is not something to be used to kind of passport your way through menopause because it isn't it isn't actually going to work um, can you explain a little bit more about that they are just much better options like the the pill is not as I said earlier it, it, there's no progesterone in the pill the the estrogen in the pill is not our natural estradiol that um, is off. For example, women in, later in menopause or later in perimenopause into menopause are, that are offered currently body identical or bioidentical hormones as a safer, better alternative for symptom management. But the pill is not that. So, you know, why we still have, I think the pill is a very old school kind of substandard type of hormone therapy that's nowhere near as good as the modern menopausal hormone therapy. So that's one reason. I think also, as I talk in the, as I discuss in the chapter cycle while you can, there's real value in trying to get as many natural menstrual cycles as you can under your belt while you still can. That's building metabolic um, reserve, which can serve us well leading into our final decades. But just in case anyone's listening who's thinking, oh, but I need the pill for hot flushes or night sweats or especially heavy periods, I just want to not be coy about it. I just want to say what the, some of the other solutions are that I talk about in the book. So one is I talk about progesterone quite a lot, which is available in the UK as eutrogestin. In some other countries, it's prometrium. It's real progesterone. It is a far better, if you have to take something stronger for lightening periods or helping prevent migraines or for mood, then I would say hands down, real progesterone is better than the pill for those things. Pro pro progesterone capsules cannot prevent pregnancy. So that's one complication. You'd have to also then use condoms or something else for avoiding pregnancy. Um, the second thing that can be on the table as a treatment idea is the hormonal coil or the hormonal IUD. I just want to mention that because as I explained in the book, it's different from the pill in that it does not suppress ovulation so always. It, I mean, sometimes suppresses ovulation, but not routinely suppresses ovulation like the pill. So the hormonal IUD can permit some natural hormone cycling, which is good. It can also reduce menstrual flow by 90%, which is obviously hugely helpful for some of the crazy heavy periods of perimenopause. I explained in the book, and I'll say again here, you could also potentially use the hormonal IUD or coil and progesterone and some of the other things I talk about in the book. So it's not just that even if you do decide to use the hormonal IUD, it doesn't mean that you can't have the benefit of some of the other things. So they don't, women don't need to suffer, basically. There are lots of options. Yes. Out there. Um, and it's like working with someone like yourself to get the right prescription um, for them. And in terms of, let's just sort of touch on, because you've mentioned insulin resistance a few times. Yeah. There, um, so that people understand. So lots of people now are tracking things like their blood sugar with <clears throat> continuous blood glucose monitors, or maybe they've gone on a ketogenic diet and they're tracking ketones. Um, insulin resistance is where the cells are becoming less, well, but more resistant to insulin, right? So it leads yeah. to higher blood sugar levels. And insulin actually is a fat storage hormone, isn't it? It prompts um, the storage of fat to a degree. Um, now, I think you make the point that if you've got lot, 
pretty much all women will experience this to some degree, but there are lifestyle modifications that we can take that will help to improve this. But in women with things like PCOS, this is likely to have a bit more of a resurgence, is it, in terms of her ability to manage blood sugar during those perimenopausal years? Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yes. And, so, and also just to clarify, insulin resistance is about having chronically elevated insulin, the hormone insulin. That's actually how I test for it is to measure the hormone. So you've got the double whammy of with insulin resistance, you've got the situation that the, the cells in the body everywhere, in particular the brain in this case, are not getting the energy they need because as you say, insulin is just kind of shuttling it into fat rather than allowing it into cells. Um, so th that's where you get this, um, what they've measured actually is a 25% reduction in brain energy in some of the later phases of perimenopause and the shift to insulin resistance. So the brain needs to be able to burn ketones as an alternative. And when, there's, when you have insulin resistance, it's difficult to have that what's called metabolic flexibility to burn ketones as an alternative to glucose. When we're healthy, we can do both. We can burn glucose, we can, the cells can switch back and forth. That's all happening in the mitochondria. And with chronically elevated insulin, insulin resistance, that's not happening. And to answer your question about women with a history of PCOS, it's a few things. It's, it's, if you have a history of PCOS, you likely have a history of insulin resistance because as you know, those, they sort of go hand in hand, although not always. Also tending to higher androgens or male hormones generally increases insulin resistance. So um, we all of us have different levels of it. It's normal to have some androgens or testosterone and women have different levels of that. But if it starts to, to be in the category of you know, tending to higher levels, that can be a risk, a metabolic risk factor. And that can um, come through in our forties again. So that's why I just think it's I, in my analysis and with my patients, the simplest thing is not to guess, just to test for insulin resistance, which I do by testing insulin. And also the other clues of insulin resistance would be things like high triglycerides on a blood test, um, especially if the other sort of markers are kind of normal, high ALT on a liver function test, um, skin tags and abdominal weight gain, that, the weight gain around the waist. Mm. Yeah, those are all signs. And in yeah. terms of, if we can touch on fasting, because you were mentioning that often women in their thought, in their forties, sorry, yeah. probably do need less carbohydrates than they've been used to yeah. eating. But fasting, um, so there's kind of going lower carb or slash ketogenic, and then there's also fasting, which can in itself, if you're pushing too much and you're fasting for too long, yeah. um, and also exclusionary diets like the ketogenic can cause their own hormone disruptions. For I'm sure. curious what you found in terms of your own practice, um, whether there's sort of an ideal wind fasting period and an ideal sort of diet type for individuals as they transition through this stage. Yeah, in my analysis, it really depends on whether there's insulin resistance or not. So women who don't have insulin resistance, who are maybe already borderline under eating, who are very active, I think they need to be careful because if they start fasting or you know, restricting their diet too much, they're, they're, they're not going to have the nutrition they need. The other difference is younger women. I know that's not what we're talking about today, but I just, I just have to kind of get that, make this point that women under 35 their hormonal system, especially if they're under 30, especially if they're under 25, their hormonal system, female hormonal system is a lot more sensitive to food signals and young women can lose their periods to a low carb diet or keto diet. So I just want to say that outright. I think my experience is that that's less likely to happen to women in their forties, although it can happen if with a severe, you know, extreme keto diet, the, the balance is, about, you know, the benefits of fasting and the benefits of lower carb versus stress hormones, right? So it's about with my patients, it's like you have the goal is to feel well. So if some part of it doesn't feel well, then it's not working. And the marker, the barometer is sleep. Mm. So what I find is some women, if they go too low carb, especially low carb in the evening, they don't sleep. And you know, I think I've put myself in that category. Like, I think if I don't have some starch mm. with the evening meal, I, I don't sleep as well. So that's where we can start to harness some of this. So my, the advice I give in the book and with my patients is to maybe 
try to extend the, the benefits of the natural overnight fast of your sleep by having a lower carb breakfast, get, get your protein, get some nutrition that you need by hopefully 10 a.m. because that signals circadian rhythm, which is also very important for all of this. And then potentially don't come in with, you know, starch until kind of later in the day. But at some point, most women are going to need something. I think just for it's the, the calming effect of starch, maybe for gut microbiome as well. All that said, I'm not anti the keto diet. I'm really not. So if there's someone who has severe insulin resistance and just feels well, you know, going full keto for at least for, you know, several months, I have no problem with that, but it's always, it, I never lose sight of the marker that it should feel good and you should be yeah. sleeping. And if that's not happening, then something's wrong. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think that is the, the best marker. And I'm this, absolutely the same as you. I find that carbohydrates, a small amount in the evening, definitely yes. contribute to better sleep. And I just, there's a sense of calm that coupled with magnesium, which I want to come on to, because you talk yeah. about magnesium being very important and also taurine as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the book. I think that's worth talking about here. For people. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stay on the topic of keto a little bit because that will lead us into the magnesium and taurine. Just for anyone listening who doesn't already know this, it's not like we have, it's not like there's a, a keto diet or the non keto diet, right? Like we, we would naturally go in and out of ke nutritional ketosis all the time, like, you know, overnight or with exercise or a little bit of fasting. So, that's cultivating metabolic flexibility. I guess what I'm saying is you don't, you don't, to get the benefits of ketosis, you don't have to be in ketosis all the time, mm. right? Like you can be in ketosis yeah. some of the time <laughs> overnight or after a big, after a big walk or something, but then you come out of it and that's okay. I mean, that's still a healthy thing to have done that. So does I say that because certainly what I've seen with some of my patients is it feels like it's very much all or nothing. Like I'll have patients tell me, oh, I tried keto for a while, but then I didn't feel good. So I just went back to eating everything, like including desserts. And like, I'm just like, wow. So there was no, for them, there was no middle ground, right? It was yeah. just all yeah, one extreme to the other. Yeah. So there's that. And then to answer your question about magnesium and taurine, that nutrient duo improves insulin sensitivity. I perhaps could have made that a little bit more clear in the book. I mean, it has many benefits, which is why I talked about it multiple times in different ways, but fundamentally for our conversation right now, magnesium and taurine support the mitochondria, which as you know, are the powerhouses in the cell, the little parts of the cell that um, turn glucose or ketones into energy and magnesium and taurine help with that. They also both directly calm the nervous system, which is extremely helpful for sleep, for anxiety, for migraines. Yeah. And what have you found in terms of the magnesium? Is that something that you would recommend having twice a day, morning and evening, or just in the evening? What have you found works best there? Yeah, I think oh, it's, it's flexible. I think there's all different ways. I mean, myself personally, and using with usually with my patients, I have a make up what we can access in Australia and New Zealand quite easily are these gorgeous powders that have both magnesium glycinate and taurine and a few activated B vitamins. And they're just, they're really quite nice. So myself, I will have that usually at about four or five o'clock. In fact, I would normally be having it now, but I'm talking to you instead. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of a pre dinner, like just to relax so that's one, that's where I use it. Some of my patients prefer to take magnesium closer to bedtime because they find it actually directly promotes sleep. I find this in terms of sleep, I find the main thing is just to get the nervous system calming down several hours before sleep. And then that together with you know everything that helps to, to promote good sleep. Yeah, for sure. And, um, it's really interesting when you look at uh, like metabolic flexibility, because yes. I think it's funny, like I learned so much from my children full stop, but <laughs> they just naturally do this so well, you know, they, yeah. they stop eating in the evening, they eat a relatively early dinner, they go to bed, they're completely yeah. fasted overnight, they wake up, they just want to kind of play, then they break their fast, have breakfast, they have mini fasts between meals, which yeah. I always encourage people yeah. I see to do because some people as you say are eating constantly and they're kind of almost absorbed in other things and they're constantly cycling between you know burning more ketones then burning more glucose and I just think we can learn a lot from them and children as young as five are very naturally doing a 12 to 14 hour overnight fast without any problems 
It's true. Um, and it, yeah, it shouldn't be hard. It's the other message too, like if you're metabolically healthy and if you've had enough protein, a lot of it comes down to that. Mm. You, the fasting is not, it's not a hardship. Like you won't feel hungry. So I think some people have this idea that it's going to, okay, this is this thing you have to endure. It's going to be hard, but no, it should be like, you're not actually hungry until it comes around time to eat again. And then you have a very satiating meal with lots of protein, and then you're not going to be hungry for four or five hours. That's a, that's the normal, that's you know, what the normal human body would do. Yeah, so. that's absolutely true. And um, the, the protein is so effective for helping increase yes. that muscle mass, which we're naturally losing, isn't it? Um, and it's very satiating as well. It's our primary yes. appetite. Do you know that I talk about it in the book a little bit? Do you know the thing it's called the protein leverage hypothesis, which is this idea that because protein is our main appetite, we will keep eating until we get enough protein. So whether and just eating everything, like it's looking, so we can harness that. We can work that hack that if you will, by making our, especially earlier in the day, making the meals quite high in protein. And then that part of your appetite is satisfied and is just naturally going to have a lower appetite throughout the day. Definitely. Yeah. Um, that's such a good point. Um, and also like, I think if people just contrast and try it one day, have something that's carbohydrate based, and then the next day decide to have a few eggs with avocados or maybe a turkey yeah. steak and some spinach and cherry tomatoes, yeah. and you will feel so, de- you just won't be hungry for four or five hours. It's um, true. I'm glad it? you gave the example of turkey because so many, my, many of my patients, they're like, okay, you have to have porridge or eggs like those are the only options I'm like well what about leftover chicken or mm. you could have a sausage from the night before like there's there's no reason like breakfast could be anything it doesn't have to be these specific breakfast foods that no. we've decided are breakfast foods and the other thing on that topic for anyone listening who's challenged by that if the idea of having turkey or sausage or chicken for breakfast isn't appealing then I would just say wait until the time when your appetite does kick in like because usually it's a question of the stomach acid needing to kick in um and that might, won't happen that won't be the case at like six in the morning very few people i think could eat a steak at six in the morning yeah, yeah. unless you're a 13 year old boy like my son well true <laughs> i guess if you're a kid yeah. yeah yeah exactly but yeah i agree with you and actually it's a signal isn't it that maybe you're not ready to eat yet if you can't actually eat a proper meal and you're exactly. only looking for something that's quite starchy and carb based maybe you're just not hungry yet because we're no, that's fancy how I, sweet. that's how i would say it i think if you, if you don't have a stomach for protein you're not ready for food yet mm, that's great yeah. i love that yeah. um yeah. the other thing that's really interesting and i haven't seen covered in this much detail elsewhere is your um you, i think you've got a chapter on it even all about histine histamine intolerance yeah. and how this gets aggravated by perimenopause yeah. and the Dow genes. Yeah. Really, really interesting because I've seen this um, with a few women recently and it's a real struggle, isn't it? Can you just explain yeah. a bit more for people that are listening? Perimenopausal allergies, I guess, if you will. So that's headaches, rashes, um, fluid attention, irritability, insomnia, nasal congestion a lot of this is related to the connection between high estrogen which is what happens in especially in the earlier phases of perimenopause and histamine or mast cells something called part of the immune system called mast cells that release histamine so this is definitely a feature i've seen with my patients through the years and it was only about i guess you know, five or six years ago, when I really started to understand, like see some of the research around estrogen and histamine and that I could see what's happening. Part of the problem is also losing progesterone because progesterone normally has an immune modulating or an immune calming effect. Estrogen is quite stimulating to the immune system. Progesterone is quite calming to the immune system. So anyone listening, you'll know this is you if you're, yeah, you've got those premenstrual headaches potentially a lot of what we describe as estrogen dominance is actually potentially a histamine reaction so then what that means is we have another way to improve the symptoms which is taking steps to reduce histamine or calm mast cells which almost always means fixing the gut usually means avoiding cow's dairy there's a few other you know strategies you can do to 
um, improve those symptoms quite dramatically sometimes, which is, which is good. So these are not, we're not talking about subtle improvements, but actually feeling really, you know, quite different. And a lot of the same strategies to reduce histamine and mast cell activation can lighten periods because uh, mast cells as part of the immune system plays a role in heavy periods in that the uterine lining is full of mast cells and they release not just histamine, but something called heparin, which is a blood thinner. So it um, contributes to the heavy periods of perimenopause. It's not the only cause. The main cause of the heavier periods of perimenopause is the loss of progesterone. I'll just say the reason we have, we lose progesterone in second puberty as we move towards menopause is as we said at the beginning, the only way to make progesterone is to ovulate and it becomes harder and harder to ovulate with, as we progress through the phases of perimenopause. And not only is it harder to ovulate in general, we might have some cycles where we don't ovulate at all and therefore make no progesterone, but we also have cycles where we ovulate, but not that well, if you will, like we have a shorter luteal phase and just don't make as much progesterone as we did when you were younger. Did you know, here's a fun fact that I quite like to share, in a healthy menstrual cycle, let's say of, you know, a 30 year old woman, um, she will make in the second half of her menstrual cycle, she makes a hundred times more progesterone than estrogen. So a hundred times. I did yes. not know that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's all to do with the, the um, units that are used to measure it. So if you look on the report, you'll actually see that estrogen is measured in much smaller units. So if you adjust for all of that, you'll see that the progesterone is a hugely important hormone. We make so much of it. Conversely, estrogen is very powerful. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take much estrogen to have an effect. So there's that side of things as well. As well. And yeah. so for women to understand whether they're ovulating, they could end up with longer cycles. They can also end up with shorter cycles, right? Oh, so yeah. if that luteal phase is shorter, then yeah. actually that's indicative. If they go down to a 24 day cycle, they probably haven't ovulated that month. Well, Actually, so the, the, the trend is for shorter cycles in our 40s. That's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. That Those could still be ovulatory cycles, but they have a shorter follicular phase because of higher FSH. I don't know how much, how technical yeah. I should be, but so the ovaries are, the ovaries are actually doing their thing a lot faster. And there may still be ovulation, may or may not be. It's not always easy to know what was an anovulatory cycle or a cycle with no ovulation? You'd know for sure if you were tracking temperatures and don't see the temperature rise. But in terms of just what the cycle looks like, it's not always that easy to tell. One of the, I'd say, key markers potentially of a cycle in which ovulation did not occur is actually a long bleed. So not, not just the five to seven days of normal bleeding but it, like if I've got someone who's been bleeding for 10 days or two weeks I'm like well that was likely an anovulatory cycle of course there could be other things going on that contribute to long bleeds so that would be a symptom that should be investigated by the doctor but usually especially in our women in their 40s it's really part of the anovulatory picture if people haven't heard the word anovulatory before it before I'll just so again, it's actually quite an important concept for anyone mm. navigating perimenopause. It's this idea that an ovulatory cycle is a cycle in which ovulation occurred, an anovulatory cycle is a cycle in which ovulation did not occur. Anovulatory cycles are also quite common with PCOS, which we've talked about before. So that's a situation where younger women are not ovulating. They might be bleeding semi-regularly, but not ovulating. Mm. Which is difficult, right? Because women that um, have PCOS, then it's trying to work out, um, is it my PCOS in my early 40s or is it that actually now I've hit perimenopause? It's both. It's both. Yeah. yeah. So it is. And I, well, you saw, I give a patient story with PCOS in your 40s. Yeah, you can definitely still have PCOS in your 40s. In fact, truly the kind of tendency to high androgens, the tendency to high insulin resistance extends into menopause. So that's because PCOS is more of a, as you know, as a hormonal condition, it's a whole body hormonal condition. It's not just about the ovaries. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, it contributes things like insulin resistance and the higher androgens as well. Yeah. Um, the thing as well. So for women, when they're in their forties, the other common symptom, which you've mentioned there a few times is this really heavy bleeding, which is so yes. difficult because they can get flooding. 
Oh, um, yeah. And again, that is something that with other conditions, right, like endometriosis, for example, um, you can get heavy bleeding. You can also get quite a lot of clotting. What should women be looking for here? Like is clotting normal that you've seen or is it more the flooding and the extent of blood loss? Because that also and then in turn leads to low iron levels, doesn't it? Which can then yeah. contribute to all that brain fog, for example. For sure. Um, so there's a huge section about this in my book, as you saw. So starting with, there's a big section on get a diagnosis. So it really is important to see the doctor, figure out what's going on. If the doctor says, oh, it's just hormonal, by that she means anovulatory cycles. I explain that in the book. Another, you mentioned endometriosis. Another condition that can contribute to heavy bleeding is something called adenomyosis, which is a sister condition of endo not unusual to have both endo and adenomyosis. And I talk about that in the book. So um, I forget the question now, just, just about what to do about that. So the first step is to get a diagnosis. And then that's when we have to start talking about treatment. We, we talked about it a little bit already. I mean, I think definitely there are situations when the hormonal ID can come into this picture and make quite a difference. So 25 years ago, when I started practicing, most of my patients by their late forties had had their uterus removed. I wouldn't say most, I'd say maybe two out of three would have had their uterus removed for heavy bleeding. So we've come a long way in terms of mm. conventional medicine and that they don't really do that as often. Now they still sometimes do remove the uterus. And I talk about that in the book as well, but more likely doctors are going to try the hormonal IUD or something called ablation or this other treatments, which is good because we actually need our uterus. Even when we're done having babies, it's still important structurally for the pelvis. So, and a lot of the time it's just to, to get through until menopause. So in a couple of the patient stories in the book, I talk about when I asked my patient the question, how old was your mom or older sisters when her period stopped? Because that's our goal finish line, right? Like that's the goal post. <laughs> if we can get if we can manage the bleeding till then, then it's all going to sort itself out. You know, the, the, obviously the bleeding stops, the uterus shrinks somewhat with, you know, to a large degree with menopause. So it doesn't have to, treatments don't have to be forever. And yeah, it's, it's the he crazy heavy periods of perimenopause are not easy. I will I acknowledge that, but I would say most of the time they respond to progesterone, which is just to say again, it's called Eutrogestin or Prometrium. I give several protocols for that. Professor Pryor and Gerilyn Pryor, who helped me with the, my book, is very adamant that progesterone can manage heavy periods in a lot of cases. If necessary, you could use that in combination with the hormonal IUD. Just to say again, there's no progesterone in the hormonal IUD or coil. That's a drug called levonorgestrel, which thins the uterine lining lightens periods, but doesn't have all the other benefits that progesterone potentially can give during this time. Yeah. The book is amazing because the book goes into the detail that people need because yeah. I think they can really, and the thing I love about the book as well is in both books is you talk about how to talk to your doctor, which I think yeah. is so important because what we're not trying to do is replace what doctors do here, but no. actually just help patients have a better conversation, isn't it? A lot of the time. Um, yeah. And I think it can be frustrating. Um, there's one more thing before you go, because this was really yeah. um, interesting for me, is you talk about iodine deficiency and the yeah. with breast lumps, because yeah. this, again, is a, a thing that women suffer with, right? In their 40s, suddenly they notice lumps that they didn't have before. Obviously, you always need to get them checked out, but they also get yeah. breast tenderness and pain as well. It's just... yeah. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's so um, funny. Uh, when we talk about women, I just think we have it quite hard, don't we? Because we go through puberty and then when we finish puberty, we kind of have a few years in our 20s where if we don't have conditions like PCOS endometriosis, it's almost a honeymoon period before you then <laughs> decide to have children and be prenatal and then you're pregnant and then you have all the postnatal and then you just kind of exit that and hello, here's perimenopause. <laughs> it's true. It's so. true. You know, there's lots of um, opportunities for things to go wrong potentially. I'm glad you you brought up the um, iodine for breast pain because it's one of my I would say favorite prescriptions because it's so reliable like it, it just works every time if and I there's a big if you know if it's safe to take so I really make this clear in the book and I need to say it again now that if there is existing thyroid disease especially something called Hashimoto's or autoimmune thyroid disease then 
it's generally not safe to take iodine or at least not the levels of iodine that I'm talking about in the book. So, but if you don't have autoimmune thyroid disease, it's a great treatment and potentially it's also quite good for mood, reduces the risk of ovarian cysts. It's one of my, it's actually one of my favorite treatments for women's health and you know why we're all so deficient or why we seem to need it i'm not sure i just, i think our diet used to have a lot more iodine than it does now mm. and so you would suggest um supplementing with that i know that you make the point that seaweed is not a good because of the bromine in it it's actually not a good way of trying to get iodine because well it can interfere yeah, with never, the uptake and i've just never seen it deliver the benefits like i'm talking about so if with my patients who if i've tested their thyroid and they're fine they don't have autoimmune thyroid disease then i give them what i describe in the book so it's a molecular iodine which is safer than potassium iodide for the thyroid and i give in the one to three milligram range which is 1000 to 3000 micrograms which is several fold higher than just the 150 you might get in a multivitamin and it's the kind of thing where someone's like you know, has had breast pain for years and maybe premenstrual anxiety and then finds after a couple of months, those symptoms are completely gone. That's the kind of treatment it can be. And I've never seen that response to seaweed. Mm. So unfortunately, so. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing treatment. And then yeah. lastly, because no, no talk on perimenopause would be complete yeah. without us talking about hot flashes. This is so yeah. hard. And you say like the brain has a slightly tighter thermoregulation. So it's almost yes. as if the brain's now responding to your body temperature increasing by very small amounts or decreasing by small amounts in a way it wouldn't normally have overreacted to. This is something that really troubles women. It's a pain yeah. at night, isn't it? It keeps them awake. It can also feel, they can feel self-conscious if they walk into a room and suddenly they have this hot flash. What have you found is the best way to, to combat that? Well, it's part of that brain rewiring or brain recalibration that we talked about earlier for sleep, for mood. It's it's the same thing. So it's a symptom. Of, it's a brain symptom. For, it's from the hypothalamus, but it's part of that rewiring. So it my experience with hot flushes is and night sweats is they respond best to some things we've already talked about. I would say magnesium and taurine is my number one combination for hot flushes, night sweats, You're getting enough exercise. The brain loves that not having insulin resistance. The brain loves that. And now we come to something that we haven't talked about yet, but I would also say quitting alcohol, mm. stop dialing it way down or maybe quitting it. And at least for a while, and this is this window of opportunity. I would say to people, you probably, when, when you hit 55 and you're a few years past your period, you can go back to that glass of wine a few times a week and that's going to be not a problem. But if you've got perimenopausal sleep problems, perimenopausal night sweats, the alcohol is just not worth it. I mean, everyone's a little bit different, but I would say the majority of my patients who try this find it sometimes eliminates the symptoms. And for myself personally, I mean, I love the occasional beer, but I'll be sitting there look, thinking about a beer, but like, you know, in the evening, it's like, I'd like to have a beer, but then I'm going to wake up all sweaty at 3 a.m. So like, do I want, do I want a beer enough to actually have to go through that sweating in the middle of the night? It's like, I don't think so. So, and so for me, that's become just quite easy to just have a no alcohol, a low alcohol beer or something else instead. So from the natural perspective, those are probably the things that work the best, magnesium, taurine, exercise no alcohol. Then from a hormonal perspective, like hormone therapy perspective, progesterone on its own, this is the eutrogestin or prometrium can help hot flushes, especially during the perimenopausal years when you're still cycling and these are premenstrual hot flushes, it can work really well. There's a case to be made too for estrogen therapy. We haven't really talked about that yet. I'm, I'm quite neutral about estrogen therapy. I mean, I think it can be helpful. A lot of my patients take it. Fortunately, as I said earlier, modern hormone therapy is almost all, not all, but mostly what's called body, body identical or bioidentical and lower dose. And like I speak about brand names in the book and how to use, if you're going to use estrogen at all, best to comb combine it with eutrogestin or prometrium and use it as a patch rather than gone are the days of an estrogen capsule. I think that's just not a safe way to take estrogen unless 
I guess for some reason you can't have a patch, but I would think try to persevere with the transdermal through the skin because it's a lot safer that way. And estrogen relieves hot flushes and night sweats. There's no question that it does. It, it restores to an extent um, the brain energy. Now I said earlier, we get this shift in to reduce brain energy or insulin resistance. Um, some, a lot of that's from losing est estrogen. So temporarily giving some of that back can help. So this would be presumably like slightly later in perimenopause when you're Yes, menopause. it would be. It's the, the final, yeah. it's the third and fourth phase. So women in the kind of what I call phase, well, what not I call, but what I describe in the book as phase one and two, estrogen is usually not needed there. But yes, by that third, especially in the fourth phase, which is the waiting room between the final, what you think might be the final period and the one year, which almost always extends into more time because you think, oh, it's been nine months and then you get a period and then you have to start counting all over again. You, that You don't just get to like go three months from that point. You have to start all over and wait 12, try to wait 12 months. So that can stretch into a few years. And that's usually when women would need, if they need it, or if they're going to need it, they need some estrogen therapy. Mm. Yeah. Whereas often you'll see doctors prescribe it quite early on. And sometimes yeah. in combination with things like testosterone, which as you say in the book, can actually aggravate things like insulin resistance. Um, well, it, ca ca it can cause weight gain. So mm. I've had a bit of discussion about this lately with some doctors who read my book. So just to say, I'm not totally anti-testosterone. I, I mean, I know it can be important for, mainly for libido or desire. It can help with that if that's really dropped off. I'm not anti it. I think you have to be careful because if there's any insulin resistance or abdominal weight gain, it can worsen that. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So I'm going to yeah. get to everything we talk about. I'd love that study yeah. that you mentioned. I'll include that in the show notes. Um, I'll send that over. Yeah. That'll be amazing. Yeah. And also the books. I just think for women that are going through perimenopause, the hormone repair manual is absolutely amazing. It's an incredible book. Mm -hmm. um, the period repair manual for listeners that are a bit younger and are just having problems um, with yeah. their periods. Again, the level of detail that you provide is so enlightening because I think people come away from, from reading your books just so well informed. And as you say, they actually know how to have a conversation with their naturopath, with their medical doctor as well. Um, yeah. which is really in this current climate, I think what we need to, to be more absolutely. educated and, and empower women really through this time. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, my goal was, well, to help, to make women feel smart has always been my goal because women are smart. <laughs> I don't want them to like come away thinking, okay, I get this. It's because women's health is not rocket science, right? Like this, it, I think we've been made to think that it's very complicated and mystical. And actually there's some parts of it that are, just makes sense. You just have to kind of understand, you know, how it works. And then you have the vocabulary and then you can, you know, hopefully get what you need. And the other thing that one of the reviews I had, which I really quite liked, was just a simple comment that, you know, the woman said, the book made me feel like everything is going to be okay. It's like, yeah. everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Perimenopause is, it can be a challenge, but it's also this very interesting things about it. And there's, so much to come after, right? Like I, I make, I really talk a couple of times about how after the turbulence of perimenopause is a really great phase of life called menopause, which for a lot of women is the happiest they've ever been. That's what the research shows. So yeah. And that's how it should be, isn't it? Isn't the Japanese word? I think it means yeah. spring, right? And it, it should means, be yeah, um, revival or second energy or something. Yeah. So there's, yeah. And if you really, once you get there, and I'm almost there because I'm 51 now. So like once you kind of get through it, you think, oh yeah, like we're kind of in on a secret. There's something about being this age and I think older where it's, there's if if your life will allow it, if you have room for it, there's a lot of space to have, start to have fun and sort of a more a lightheartedness, which I describe in the book a little bit. I hope that's there for most listeners eventually. Yeah. And I think, I think you describe it really well. And I think it is, a, yeah. as, as you say, it's a really great passport through to really help women. And there's so much shared and you have so 25 years of experience to share, mm -hmm. which is so helpful. Where can people connect with you, Lara? Um, where's the best place to find yeah. you? I'm very easy to find. My blog is larabryden.com. All of my social media, which is really just Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is at Lara Bryden. And I've just got the two books, which we've talked about hormone repair manual today, period repair manual for younger women, including daughters of anyone listening today. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what I have. 
And do you still take on patients or do you, are you full time? Only locally in, in, in Christchurch. So I have, a, I have consulting rooms in Christchurch, New Zealand, where I live currently. So I, I did work with patients much more in Sydney, Australia, where I was there for 20, 15 years. So, yeah. But now just locally. Amazing. Yeah. I will link to everything that we've talked about today in the show notes and including where people can find you. Um, thank you so much for spending time and taking time out of your evening yeah. um, to come on the show. Thanks for having me.